Yeah, thank you for everyone who is, is already here and eager to listen. Um, my name is Carly Morgan. I'm a final year PhD candidate at the Center for Film and Screen, and I'm one of the volunteers working with Cambridge Reproduction this year to organize this Early Researchers Seminar Series. Um, this is part of the Early Researchers Seminar Series that is hosted by Cambridge Reproduction, and we would like to extend our gratitude and our thanks to all of the other volunteer coordinators who are organizing this series, and of course, to, to all of the speakers who have agreed to take part especially the speakers who are joining us today. Um, so just a brief introduction to the speaker series and to Cambridge Reproduction more broadly. The seminars are held online on the thir first Thursday of each month at 1 p.m. This is the last seminar series of 2022, but we will be starting again in January, and we'd love to have more speakers for next year. So if you're a postgraduate student or a postdoc in Cambridge and you would like to take part in this early researcher seminar series, please follow the link in the Cambridge Reproduction website or the link that will be dropped into the chat. So to offer a reminder and a brief description of what Cambridge Reproduction is, Cambridge Reproduction is an interdisciplinary initiative that brings together researchers from across the university who have an interest in any aspect of reproduction, everything from science, technology, and medicine to arts and humanities. Membership is open to all staff and postgraduate students, and it gets you access to all of our events, funding schemes, and our regular newsletters, which have research highlights, events, and opportunities in reproduction research. And speaking from personal experience, Christina does a phenomenal job um, coordinating and sending out all of these opportunities, events, and um, the latest news. So I highly recommend subscribing. To join us, just download the membership form from our website and send it on to Christina, the Cambridge Reproduction Coordinator. And again, there will be a link for this in the chat. Um, so just to offer an overview of how today's session will run, there will be two 20 minute presentations from our speakers follow it, followed by a lightly moderated Q&A. And I'm sure that all of you are um, experts and eminently familiar with how this works, but we'd ask that you either use the hand raise function in Zoom and I can call on you and you can pose your question that way, or you're welcome to post your question in the chat. And I can um, raise that uh, to the speakers that way. So our first speaker today is going to be Marie-Hélène Peterspies. She's a PhD researcher in law at the University of Zurich in Switzerland and works for its Human Reproduction Reloaded Research Center. She's also an adjunct lecturer at Sciences Po Paris, the Rams campus and is currently a visiting researcher at the Faculty of Law at the University of Cambridge. Prior to her doctoral studies, Marie-Hélène also worked as an attorney at law in Geneva, Switzerland. And she will be delivering a talk entitled Surrogacy, Filiation, and the Rethinking of Legal Parenthood, Recent Developments Before the European Court of Human Rights. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Marie-Hélène. Um, yeah, so good afternoon. Thank you so much for um, the kind invitation. I am very grateful to be able to take advantage of my time as a visiting researcher here at Cambridge to participate to the seminar. Um, as you just heard, I will today talk to you about surrogacy, filiation, and the rethinking of legal parenthood by looking into recent developments before the European Court of Human Rights. So this presentation is based on a paper that I recently co-authored with my colleague um, Eliana Brodeala, who is actually here with us and um, also works in the Human Reproduction Reloaded project at um, the University of Zurich. But this presentation is also based on some um, additional research we are conducting as a follow-up um, as there are constantly new developments in the field. So just a few words on the outline. I will start um, with a short introduction and then some considerations on surrogacy before the European Court of Human Rights. First, by talking about the trends in its previous case law and then by focusing on some recent developments. I will continue with some reflections on the rethinking of legal parenthood 
particularly on the role of genetics, biology and care in defining a parent. And then I will finish the presentation with a few open issues and concluding thoughts. So just to first provide you with some background, um, as you probably know, in most, um, most of Co Council of Europe member states, all forms of surrogacy are prohibited. And in many jurisdictions, this is even enshrined at constitutional level. The bans have, um, however, proved rather ineffective in preventing intended parents from accessing surrogacy. Um, so that many individuals and couples in these countries seeking to fulfill their desire to become parents engage in cross-border surrogacy. And so this gives rise to a variety of legal and social issues, in particular uh, regarding the recognition of filiation between intended parents and the children born through surrogacy. And so more precisely, um, usually a birth certificate is issued in the country where the surrogacy took place, listing the intended parents as legal parents. However, the recognition of the birth certificate may be denied at home, especially when there is no genetic link between the intended parent and the surrogacy born child. And so the absence of filiation can have possible consequences on nationality, voting rights, residence rights, parental care, but also maintenance claims and inheritance rights, among others. And so against this background, a number of cases on this matter have reached national courts, but also international ones, such as the European Court of Human Rights. And so this leads us to the recent developments that we will discuss today. So to understand recent developments, it is important to briefly talk about the previous trends in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights on the refusal to recognize filiation to um, surrogacy-born children in domestic law. And so in recent years, the European Court of Human Rights case law has tended to favor intended parents and especially fathers who were genetically linked to their surrogacy born children. In fact, it was deemed that such fathers should be granted immediate legal recognition through entry in the civil registry, despite having resorted to surrogacy abroad. So in the famous Menison case, particularly, the importance of biological parentage was seen as a component of identity and its non-recognition was deemed contrary to the child's best interests, violating Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights on the child's um, right to respect for private life. And so Conversely, intended social parents with no genetic or biological connection to the surrogacy born child were often refused parental recognition. And so just a few words on the terminology um, used here more precisely on the terms biology and genetics. So um, when it comes to men, they are interchangeable, but um, the meaning can actually vary when women and all persons with a womb are involved. And so in this context, genetics would refer to when the egg of the intended parent has been used and biology would refer to the gestational aspect of parenthood. So that means having carried the child. And so to go back to these trends, we could really see a strong emphasis on genetics and biology um, in terms of parentage on the part of the court. So now to continue with these trends, what is interesting is the following. So we talked about genetic fathers um, as regards mothers. Um, the situation is a little different as a lot of legal orders place a large emphasis on the biological event of giving birth as enshrined in the matter semper certa est principle, which basically means that we know for sure who the mother of the child is. And so usually there is a presumption that the person giving birth is the legal mother. And so in that case, that would be the surrogate. 
And so as a result, it tends to be more difficult for the intended mothers to get legal recognition. There were, however, some um, interesting developments not so long ago. Um, and so in an advisory opinion, which was confirmed by subsequent case law, the court ruled that domestic law should provide a possibility of recognition of the relationship with the intended um, genetically unrelated mother whose partner, the genetic father, had already been recognized in domestic law. However, the court held that such recognition must not necessarily take the form of entry in the register of births, but that other means, such as adoption, for instance, may be used, provided it is prompt and effective. Um, it happens as soon as the relationship has become a practical reality, and also in accordance um, with the child's best interests. And so this is interesting because it shows a certain departure from the importance of genetics and biology in parentage, even though this evolution remains limited. First, because the unrelated um, genetically um, mother benefits from alternative means of recognition, but not from a direct entry in the civil register. Second, this recognition is, um, we could say, mediated because it is linked to the fact that the intended mother's partner, the genetic father, has already been recognized. And then the relationship must only be recognized once it has become a practical reality, but not ab initio. And so this could also lead to uncertainty. You know, what, what if something happens during that time, you know, before um, the adoption has been finalized. And finally, the court suggested that an intended mother with a genetic connection to the child would be even more entitled to be recognized as the mother of the surrogacy born child. So this again shows this importance um, of DNA here. So this leads us to some recent developments. And here I'm going to focus on a judgment that was rendered by the European Court of Human Rights as recently as two weeks ago. Um, and so this judgment featured a male same-sex couple who had children through surrogacy abroad using the sperm of one of the partners and donated eggs. And so the affiliation to the genetic father was recognized. However, this was not the case for the other intended father. Later, um, the adoption of the child by the social father, so the one without genetic link, was granted by Swiss authorities following a change in law. However, it was preceded by long waiting periods. Um, so in the end, the child was almost eight years old when he was finally adopted. So what was the outcome of this case here? Um, so here, the court held that the child's right to respect for private life was violated due to the impossibility for the intended genetically unrelated father to be recognized for too long. And so what are the key takeaways from this case and this outcome? So first, um, the principle of this advisory opinion and subsequent case law that you know um, I mentioned before that were about the recognition of the female partner of the genetic father, um, they also apply to male same-sex couples in a registered partnership. So that's very interesting because the rule had the, the court has not previously ruled on such matter before. And so um, it's interesting because the advisory opinion concerned an opposite sex married couple. And um, so this is obviously, you know, some news in that. Um, and it's also another confirmation of the importance of this advisory opinion in the case law of the court, even though um, such opinions are not necessarily binding case law. And so all in all, um, this means that the genetically unrelated intended father, whose partner, the genetic father, has been recognized in domestic law, must be provided some form of recognition, of course, provided it is in the best interests of the child. 
And so this confirms um, a cert this certain trend of this departure from um, genetics and biology, even though, um, again, it remains limited in the same way as mentioned, you know, because um, these um, fathers are provided with this other means and not with a direct um, recognition. So um, as in the case of the mother previously mentioned, there can be um, legal uncertainty. But in addition to this departure from this genetic um, essentialism, it is interesting as we can observe a certain openness towards new family forms on the part of the court, giving more legal protection to um, in case male same-sex couples um, as parents. So with that in mind, it's interesting to reflect on the roles of biology, genetics, and also care in establishing parentage. And so here, some trends can be identified. Um, while the best interests of the child always prevail, um, biology in terms of giving birth mostly takes precedence in determining motherhood over both genetics and intention. And while genetics usually carry more weight than pure intention or care in um, these cases. And so this is very interesting um, as in light of the advent of DNA just a few decades ago, this element um, could previously not be taken into account as there was just no um, uh, proof or testing. Um, but this, these trends, this can however result in situations of inequality for instance, between intended parents, um, here, you know, the genetic mother usually cannot benefit from direct recognition, contrary to a genetic father, for instance, but also between different family forms. And so against this background, the question arises as to whether legal parenthood should be rethought in some ways, and if applicable, to which extent to um, best accommodate today's new um, reproductive options and family forms. And it's also important to reflect on why certain parameters are given more um, weight than others, as it also largely rel relates to um, societal values. So this leads us to a few open issues and concluding thoughts. So the evolution of the European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence on these matters seems to embrace new family forms and value intention parenthood, um, thus departing from its previous um, genetic and biological essentialism, um, but to a certain limited extent. Um, and so as mentioned, this progress remains limited and some individuals or family forms can still face strong challenges, especially those parents who need to rely on other means or adoption um, to have their filial link recognized. Um, so here we could call them the other parents. Um, and so for instance, they can face very lengthy adoption procedures. Um, it's even unclear here what exactly is required um, in terms of this you know, promptness and effectiveness that is um, required um, from these procedures. Um, also, there can be a lack of protection in case of a disruption in the adult relationship. So what happens in case of separation or even death? Um, and so in general, this shows how social realities of globalized fertility services are changing family norms. And the court is struggling to try to follow these changes without stepping too much on the state's margin of appreciation um, as it touches upon a very private area. So in any case, it will um, certainly be interesting to see further evolutions on the part of the court, but also at um, national levels in the field. And so with that, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to our discussion. Mm -hmm.